you doing? Can you hear me okay? Is this working out? Thank you for that kind introduction. And I'm glad I wasn't born in 1930. I'm not able to walk. <laughs> the field of forgiveness has grown tremendously over the last three years, uh, 30 years. I started studying forgiveness in 1985. I started my doctoral work in 83 at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. After two years, when I was done with my coursework, my advisor approached me, do you need a topic for sure to write your dissertation on? I said, I sure do. I haven't found one. And you know, the graduate students, you know the experience of finding a topic that you want to write about and you want to spend some time on it. And you want to make sure that the topic is something that you really like or that and also is something that's useful and you can use it as a good benefit for others. So in 85, my advisor and I had a meeting, usually we met about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And he said, I found a topic I don't know if you like it or not, but if you do, I'm really, I would be very excited to work with you. I said, what is it? He said, it's forgiveness. And what the word forgiveness, when he said it, it conjured up in my mind, that of an imam, that of a rabbi, that of a priest in a, a religious institution. And here I am, I'm studying to be a developmental psychologist. I wasn't in a spiritual realm. I wasn't studying theology. I associated the word forgiveness more to theology, philosophy, than to psychology. So, but there was an appeal to his invitation, and I said, Consider me on board. I think this is a topic that I can learn a lot about. There was an appeal to his invitation, so I said, consider me on board. I am going to be signing on, and I'll study it. He said, now you begin. On that first day, right after I left, he sent me to the library to find out as many articles as I can find about the topic of forgiveness. And I was so excited to see him again the following week, because it was once a week. I had nine articles that I found. When I came to him, he said, these articles are helpful. These were all from philosophy and, and uh, theology. But he said, we want to look at it from a psychological point of view. So we have a lot of work to do. So our work on the search and the research of the scientific study of forgiveness began on that year, 1985. And I'm happy to report to you today, 2016, that from nine articles, the field now boasts more than 1,000 articles that have been refereed and published in different journals. It wasn't easy to penetrate the intellectual community and get things published in this field. But uh, with persistence and good research, we were able to get things published and get the work out. And also there are centers for forgiveness. There are journals devoted to the study of forgiveness. And many conferences, national and international, have been convened about the topic. So I would like to share with you today a synopsis. I cannot possibly go over all the details of what we have discovered about this very important topic in one hour. And I would also would like to leave some time for questions and answers. So I'm going to give you uh, a little bit of background about the topic, the phenomenon of forgiveness, what it is and what it's not. What is forgiveness and what is not forgiveness? And a basic premise about what forgiveness is and why some people find it or many people find it so difficult to forgive. Why is this something that is hard to do? A lot of people say it's a good thing, but when it comes to, to doing it, it is one of the most difficult things that humans uh, do. So I want to explore with you and share with you some of the roadblocks that make uh, forgiveness really difficult 
when a person doesn't forgive, what are they likely to experience when they forgive? What are they likely to experience? And then I want to spend most of the time on the process of forgiveness. So you have something to forgive somebody about. What do you do? What is the process? So that is the agenda I would like to follow with you. Why forgiveness? Why people say it is good? Philosophers say that <coughs> forgiveness is humanizing. It makes you human again. It makes you healthy. It restores your physical, psychological, and spiritual well-being. It connects you to yourself after you have been separated, after that long distance between you and yourself because of all the pain that was incurred because of what happened. Forgiveness is a very complex process, very complex process that usually occurs after an injury, after a transgression. Somebody does something against you. And that transgression needs to meet three conditions for it to put you in a crisis of forgiveness. The first one is that this person, there are different types of forgiveness. Person to person, person to a group, and then self-forgiveness. And what I focus my research on is person to person, or interpersonal forgiveness. It's a complex process that occurs after an injury that is personal, that is very deep, and that is very unfair. The injury, what happened, what that person did to you, was not fair. You did not do anything to deserve it. And it is not like somebody said something bad to you once, or somebody bumped into you and hurt your shoulder as they were walking, and they did not know that they hurt you. That, that does not put the person in a crisis of forgiveness. What it, what it takes is something that is really a deep, deep injury that leaves you uh, in a lot of pain, it leaves you in shock, it leaves you disillusioned, and that cycle of pain could take a very, very long time to heal. So we're talking about self-healing, healing the wounds. My, our basic premise, the Madison, UW Madison, uh, the university there, which is the pioneer in the scientific study of forgiveness, the basic premise under which we work is that forgiveness is unnatural. It is not a natural response. It's not the first thing that comes to our mind when somebody does something unfair and deep to us. What is natural, though, is that we want to retaliate. We want to seek revenge. We want to hit back. We want to even the score. We want to give them a taste of their own medicine. We want to show them that they cannot get away with it. So getting even is natural not forgiveness. So forgiveness is making that which is unnatural, natural to you, because it is a humanizing, it is a restorative, it is helpful. You may ask, okay, that is a brief definition of forgiveness. What is not forgiveness? Forgiveness is not forgetting. When you forgive, you do not forget what a person did to you. If somebody, and I used this example last night, if you confided a very deep and deeply personal secret in a friend, and you trusted that they would keep that secret, and then they divulged, they revealed, they shared, and they told that secret to somebody else, and all of a sudden, the whole town, the whole village, the whole city, the whole world community knows what the secret is. Of course you will be shocked. Of course you will be hurt. And your reputation, uh, you as a person, will be in that crisis of forgiveness. So when you forgive, you never forget. But your response to what happened is different, qualitatively different. At the beginning, your response is hostile. It could be anger. It could be rage, it could be uh, sorrow, it could be sadness, it could be a range of negative emotions. 
but when you forgive, you still remember what happened, but the, the negative emotions are no longer. But you still remember what happens. Forgiveness is not forget. You never forget something that was so deep and so unfair that was done for you. Forgiveness is not reconciliation. Reconciliation is often uh, equated with forgiveness. Forgiveness leads and opens the gate for reconciliation to happen. Reconciliation is usually defined as getting together, restoring a relationship. You have a friend, you have become estranged from one another, you no longer talk to one another, you no longer associate with them, visit with them, socialize with them, because that person was not is, did not deserve, uh, did not deserve your passion right, because of what they did. You may choose still not to be friends with them, but still hold goodwill toward them, not ill will, goodwill toward them. And it's not condoning what that person did. When you forgive a person for something uh, they did against you, the transgression, you're not saying what you did is okay. It's fine. You recognize what they did as bad, as something that is unethical, immoral, and also to you very hard. And it's not pardon. Many of the philosophers said that if you allow people and if you encourage people to forgive, that is going to promote what is called letting people off very easily. You know, letting people off the hook very easily. What's going to happen to the legal system? You can commit a crime, you can commit murder, and somebody is going to is not going to go to jail, and they're not going to get justice. You know, that's probably what some people think about. So forgiveness is not part of justice. And forgiveness can exist side by side. And uh, if, you, if you recall, in the 80s. Somebody from a Turkish origin uh, tried to assassinate and one of the popes, the Vatican's, and he was put behind the jail. And later on, the pope went and expressed his forgiveness to him while, I think his name was Muhammad Aga, or Aga. Uh, he was behind jail and the pope came and, and uh, forgave him while he was still serving his jail cell. So justice and forgiveness can uh, exist side by side. And forgiveness is not mere diminishing of anger over time. Because you know, when somebody does something to you, if you hurt quite a bit today, tomorrow, for a month, for two months, for a year, but over time, probably the pain subsides a little bit. Forgiveness is not that. You don't do anything, it just, over time, it diminishes. <coughs> on its own. So why is it difficult for people to forgive? A, a scholar in the US by the name C.S. Lewis said, everybody says how great forgiveness is until they have something to forgive. It's wonderful. Go ahead and forgive. But when they themselves are in the position to forgive somebody else, they find how difficult it is. The first roadblock thing that prevents people from forgiving is negative emotions, negative feelings. And there are positive, active, and passive emotions. Like I said earlier, anger, rage, and hostility are among the active emotions that prevent us from wanting to uh, forgive somebody else. Then the passive emotions like feeling unsafe, you shut down, you're feeling stressed, your feelings of emptiness and also being alone, worry, and anxiety, even depression. Holding to, to these emotions can be very devastating to the individual. Uh, somebody said that holding on to anger is like drinking poison 
why do you think the other person is going to die out of that poison? You're the person who's drinking the poison, and you're the one who's wasting away. Anger, somebody else also described it as an acid that has very slow effect. It, it kills you very, very slow. And that's why to forgive is an option that is more wise than holding on to negative emotions. Negative emotions is one roadblock to uh, forgive. Also, our desire to retaliate, to really show that person, to punish that person. And that happens. There are many acts of revenge, more so than we see for acts of forgiveness. Pride, feelings of pride. Your feelings of pride have been injured. Somebody uh, disrespected you, and it takes a long time and lots of actions for feelings of pride to be restored. It's not easy. There are also some misconceptions that people have about what forgiveness is and is not, and I alluded to these in the definition. For example, we do not forgive because we think forgiveness, if we forgive, people will think of us, you are a weak person. You have no self-respect. If you had self-respect, you would stand up for yourself and you would go and show that person that you're not somebody to play with. Okay? Nobody messes with little ones. So these are misconceptions. Gandhi said, forgiveness is not for the weak. Forgiveness is an attribute of the courageous. Only courageous people can forgive. And you can see examples of this throughout history. And uh, tomorrow, in the Muslim tradition, is the occasion for the birth of Imam Ali, who is an, an example of forgiveness, who forgave the person who killed him who struck him with a sword that was soaked in poison for you know, 100 days. And he uh, instructed his sons to feed him of the best food and not to chain him, and that if he were to live, then it would be up to him to forgive him of the punishment. It's an example of uh, forgiveness, and it's not a sign of forgiveness. So sometimes, how we think of forgiveness, and if we do it, we're always mindful of what other people might think of us. You're not there. Don't show them. Don't uh, teach them a lesson. <coughs> but one of the examples, one of the reasons, one of the major roadblocks for why people do not forgive is not knowing how to do it. And this is what I want to spend more time on. Uh, and I'd like to be mindful of the time so that I do not run over. Forgiveness is a process, and it takes time. It could take a lot of time, depending on what the person has suffered, what the person has endured. And it requires, it means a lot of hard work. And pay attention to the next one. And it takes a lot of hard work. Work from the heart. Hard and hard work. It takes commitment to the process. If you want to forgive, you need to really work because you're going to reap many benefits from it. It takes willingness. Nobody can coerce you. Nobody can push you. Nobody can say, please forgive or else. You have to do it willingly. It's a choice. And that is something, remember, in 1991, I was on public radio in Iowa, and uh, somebody called after the program was over, and she said, you said something during the program that, to me, my priest never said. You always said, go and forgive that person. The Bible said this, the Bible said that. That was the audience that I was speaking to. But you said in your remarks that it is a choice, it's a process. Sometimes you give a presentation and the different words, the different things that we, that settle in our minds, 
this is whatever we need. For her, she needed to hear that it was a choice. Nobody can tell her when to do it. She does it when she's ready. And also forgiveness takes a lot of will, an active will, determination. So I want to walk you through quickly seven different stations that we go through when we are in a, a crisis of forgiveness, from pain and injury, from hurt and suffering, to freedom from pain, to uh, coming back to yourself, to being your old, even better self, and healthy, both physically, mentally, and your relationships with others and around you are restored. So the first station, so we're traveling, we're on a journey. The first station that we, we must go through, and this is a process model that we spent a lot of time on, and lots of research has been done on this, and the outcomes uh, through empirical research have been very impressive. And I can give you some references if anyone desires, I'd be more than happy to leave my card with you and share some of these uh, works that have been published. Awareness of injury is the first station, that's the type. To be aware of what happened. Because what happened when somebody transgresses against you is your psychological defense mechanisms kick in. It's a natural, that's their job. God put it in us to protect us. So we distance ourselves from the pain. It's a buffer against pain and, and suffering. So psychological defense mechanisms, if they are temporary, it's okay. But for many individuals that we have talked to, that we interview for different transgressions, including sexual abuse, domestic violence, betrayal, uh, marital affairs, marital destructions, marital strife, and, and on and on. So many different transgressions. That the psychological defenses become a crutch. It becomes not a temporary response, but rather an enduring and a permanent panacea, just like the medication that they live on. What are some of these defense mechanisms? There are many that not Freud, but his daughter, Anna Freud, was the one who developed these. It was her contributions, which Freud never really acknowledged publicly. He took them credit, but his daughter was the one who contributed with this to uh, psychology, and I think it's one of the most notable contributions. It includes rationalization. You know, you intellectualize in order to not feel the pain. These are all attempts not to face what happened. Compensation, you do something more pleasure. Why suffer? Repression is big, and that leads to anger, and leads to anger turned inward, which is depression. We repress, we take it under, we put it in our subconscious, thinking that it's gonna go away. But what psychologists have discovered is that when you repress, what happens is it grows bigger and bigger. And it continues to motivate our behavior in ways that we may not have Also, denial is a big one. What happened? Nothing happened to me. I'm okay. Everything is coming. Denial is also one of those defense mechanisms. So we need to become aware of the issue. We need to be aware of the different reactions that we have employed to the issue that we have experienced. And that takes, me, takes us in our journey now to station number two. So the first one is to be aware of the injury. Do you employ defense mechanisms and also all the negative emotions that go with the anger, the rage, the depression, the sadness, the uh, estrangement, hostility, all of these are part of that third station. It's not a pleasant station because it is full of tremendous emotions. Second one is experiencing the pain. To be aware and then to allow yourself to experience. And here in this station, 
And when I give this talk, it's really you know, a form of a workshop that takes about a week. And we do a lot of exercises, and we spend probably half a day at each station. And here we are spending two minutes. I mean, to experience the thing. And some of the questions that I have the participants work on is, what happened? So we want you to go back. We think there is denial. We think you are intellectualizing. What happened? So we provide the opportunity for the participant to actually face the injury that they do not want to face because it's ugly. It's a source of pain. When did it happen? Who was involved? Because sometimes that injury, the person who did something to us, we dehumanize that individual. Yes, he did something or she did something terrible, but they no longer become human. They're like a demon, and we demonize them. They're below human. So it's easy for us to talk about them, to gossip about them, to attack bodies, to spread. And we see how it becomes so negative. And it makes it harder for us to also think about what we're doing that we're doing. How did, I, how did you react at the time of the injury? And how have you reacted ever since? That is part of experiencing the pain. So providing the opportunity for the individual to really own that pain and to really experience it because it's important and it's key okay. to be it is key to getting and reading the benefits of the living system. Then we move on from awareness, third station, experience the pain to the third station which is dealing with you're aware of it, you experienced it hopefully, and then you deal with it. This is where a person is the, the road forks. You have to go either this way or that way. One we call it intrapersonal. The other one is interpersonal. Intra is within you, right? within the person. Something that you do uh, by yourself yourself for yourself and this could be positive or negative and we have found through interviews that some people engage in pleasurable activities all of a sudden they discover they have a talent for painting drawing they are artists and they invest a lot of time in it and that takes them away from the agent maybe they're fantastic photographers they love to engage in aesthetic pursuits. They go to museums, they go to musicals, they go to concerts, or whatever that uh, provides them pleasure. They may read a lot of books. Some of books is a huge, multi-billion dollar business, not in this country, but throughout the world. Uh, so these are some of the positive things that a person can do. It's intrapersonal because you do it for yourself. You can also do interpersonal. You talk to somebody else. You talk to a professional helper. You talk to a parent. You talk to a friend, a trusted friend. You talk to a trusted adult. So whoever is willing to listen. And let me just share with you here we also conducted a lot of uh, funny uh, and almost comedic incidents in, in the process of forgiveness. One of the participants I had in one of the workshops I met said, I used to go to a professional counselor, a psychotherapist, for something that I have uh, been dealing with. And sometimes it caused me asthma. And for well, asthma, he was taking a lot of medication, and the dosage kept increasing. And so he had difficulty with breathing. You can see how unforgiveness can lead and almost suffocate a person. In this case, it did. So he said, I found the best psychotherapist, and the cheapest was my barber. I go to him. He asked me how my day is. He says, good morning or good afternoon. And he really expresses interest in me and really listens. And listens very actively. 
And usually it makes me feel good, so I stopped going to my psychotherapist for whom I was paying $125,000 an hour. And here I get a haircut and a good psychotherapy for $10. That's one of the things that we could like. So that was his way of dealing with the pain. But interpersonal can also be that I decide to seek justice. So I take the person to court if the situation warrants it. Or I meet out the punishment. I become the judge. And I become the executioner. I become the one to put that judgment into action. And that is revenge. revenge. And we also explore revenge, the different types of revenge. Uh, it could be the active one, but it could also be cognitive, where I'm always thinking, I wish that person could drive down. I wish that person could be paralyzed. I wish that person could lose their ability to talk, to hear. You know, all of these revengeful uh, thoughts and also revengeful feelings. If something bad happens to the other person, if something befalls them, we are elated, we are excited. So it could be vicarious revenge. The other route in the interpersonal is couched within the umbrella of mercy. That's where forgiveness really is situated. So you explore the mercy route. That is something I have not looked at in a person who would say to him or herself. So they may have now the inclination, the initial desire, revenge didn't do it, rage didn't do it, talking about that individual did not do it. Maybe I gotta try something else. Sometimes people bump into this by accident, but oftentimes through the help of somebody, especially now, there are people that are being trained in forgiveness therapy. So we use, they use that modality. As, uh, as a therapy and the uh, client then will learn about what forgiveness is uh, and how to do it. The first thing within the mercy, if a person decides that they are going to be merciful toward the person who did them wrong, who wronged them, is to find out what stage of forgiveness are they. And last night I shared with some of the friends six stages of forgiveness that also came under the work of E.W. Madison in the, the forgiveness book. Uh, Enright and Wood. Enright is the name of the professor and he's still very active in this field. As a matter of fact, he is now uh, trying to convene a conference probably in, uh, in Jerusalem where he wants to invite people from different faiths, different traditions, to talk about forgiveness as a vehicle of peace, world peace. And that is beyond my focus today and my research focus because I'm more interested in the interpersonal, but not the uh, macro, but more the micro uh, focus. The six stages of forgiveness is, well, the first one that we, that we uh, came up with was revengeful forgiveness. The, we, we find this among children. When children fight, they, they transgress against each other. If I hit you back, if I do the same thing that you did to me, then that's forgiveness and we can be friends with them. And you, you see children, it's so easy for them to be friends. You want to be my friends? They do not read about, around the bush, right? I hit you, now you're my friends again. This is easy. I wish we could be childlike uh, most of the time. The, the second stage is restitutional. If during the transgression, you what you did cost me money, or I put a monetary value on the injury that you caused me, so I say you pay me this sum of money and you're forgiven. You're released. I no longer hate you, I no longer uh, have ill will toward you. And the third stage is called respectful or expectation of forgiveness. This is where my friends expect me to forgive or they tell me to forgive and I do it for them, not for myself. And this is usually found among adolescents. 
which are the more susceptible to field pressure, to what the peer, the group, expects. And the fourth type is lawful expectation. Well, now the expectation is not from peers, but rather from an authority figure. Usually, uh, just like the religious authority, could be your boss, it could be somebody that you hold in high esteem. And the fifth one, now the fifth and the sixth, we get higher, and um, quality could be different out of forgiveness. Forgiveness has harmony. We believe that if you forgive that person, it's going to restore, maintain and restore harmony in the community. But instead of people talking about this, and everybody is, is uh, really preoccupied with what happened, some people, and then alliances are created, an alliance is for the transgressor, and an alliance for the victim. Now the community is, is, is all one, and what you care about is the unity. So you forgive for the sake of the community. And in communal communities, that usually happens. And the very last one, is that you forgive, and we call it forgiveness as love. And that is the hardest, and that's what Gandhi said, it takes courage to, to do. This is where you think of the other person not as a demon, as an injurer only. You do not define that person only by what he or she did, but you say, they are human. That person is a human being, just like me. And let me try to understand and put this whole injury business into perspective so that you can understand it, you're not excusing it, you're not condoning it, you're not trying to deny or intellectualize, but rather to look at it so that you can understand it and hopefully arrive at some deeper meaning. So we are done with the decision to forgive, right? Intra Enter the person decides forgiveness may be a choice. This is where they learn about us. This is where the therapist helps them with different ways. And the last two stations is the forgiveness students. This is where a person actually learns some approaches that would help them forgive the other person. And the first one is called reframing. In reframing, you look at that person's background, what may have been happening at the time when they uh, wronged you, and what could have precipitated uh, the event. What could have led to it? What caused it to be? And I also shared last night because I gave not this talk, but bits and pieces that one individual who had been estranged from his dad because his dad called him a dummy, did not respect him, punished him. There was both verbal as well as physical abuse in the perspective of the son. And he said it told me a great deal when I started reframing, looking at my dad in perspective. So the time that he was doing all these bad things to him, that he's remembered very vividly all the details of what his dad did. You remember, and we recorded all this. And uh, he said, I discovered that my dad was working real hard. Uh, and he was a victim of his time, because the expectation is that you're the man of the family, you bring home the living, and you keep the rock above your family's head. And when he was laid off, things got really difficult, and it became unbearable for him to be a man and not to be earning a living. So all these negative experiences led him to be uh, increasingly more violent, uh, physically and verbally. And this son bore the brunt of his dad's uh, unthoughtful violence. And that helped him to forgive his dad. He said it did take uh, a day or two. It took a while for me to finally be at peace with him. Empathy is trying to really get into the mind, the brain of the injured. You allow yourself, can I go into this person's head and really see the world through their eyes, through their perspective. Just so that you can understand 
what motivates them, what makes them tick, what makes them function as a, as a human being. And then you may discover things that make you also sympathize, which is suffering. That person could be weak, and this is their way of making up for that weakness. So we, we discover a lot of things. These tools you can only engage in when read in this case, when you have become aware, you experience, and you dealt with the pain, and then you look at the different approaches that you may have uh, used in the past, and that is proved to be very productive. But some of the things that also need to happen is that you may be changed now because of what happened. In Iowa, not far from where we live, in, in the town of Cedar Falls, in Dyke, which is rural, Iowa is very well known for corn and, and uh, they grow uh, and they raise a lot of pigs, probably the capital uh, of uh, pork industry is, is in Iowa, and a lot of corn. And there was a, a group of college students who decided that they wanted an outing in one of the farms, one of the friends' farms. And uh, they were consuming alcohol that night, and maybe consumed too much. So some of them uh, passed out in the van, and one of them woke up during the night, and went out in the van, and it was a little chilly, so he, uh, I don't know, his uh, drunken state, he built a fire right by the van, and slowly the fire got bigger, and there was a fire, and the van exploded. And it killed two of the friends, and one of them survived. And the person who did the fire also died in the process. So there was only one survivor. And I saw the story, and of course, it's, you know, said forgiveness and revenge right away it caught my attention and I flipped it and I still have it. But this person you would not recognize his face. Third degree birds. And his face was completely defaced. It's not a human being's face. It's not pleasant to look at. You, you sympathize and you feel for that human being. But he was talking about the person who did the fire and did this thing. And he said, I'm still not at peace with it. I'm working on it. He said, it's my fault as much as that person's fault. So we're talking about instances that could be uh, very intense. I wish I would have brought that picture to show you. Uh, some of you may find it too bad. So this individual, my point is, would have when he finally forgives truly forgets, completely forgets, he needs to accept the new change in his identity. The face that he has is not the face that is that he was born. So when a person finally forgets what happens, for all of this work, what happens? And I I have collected different uh, descriptors from various people. People say, who have forgiven, I feel grateful, I feel humble, I am full of faith. That could be a religious faith or faith in, in the future. They become more hopeful, more optimistic. Full of love, where before they were full of the opposite. They feel grounded, they're back to reality, not out of it. They feel relaxed, people know this. They're not on edge. And they also see good in them. So they see injury. There is something that is good. So they, they look at the lesson. Maybe this was meant to be. It's a story. They, they see solutions, not problems. They feel present, not absent-minded. When a person is in the height of a forgiveness crisis, they're with you but they are elsewhere. They're preoccupied and they, they don't listen to us well. They feel brave. They feel safe. They feel happy, even giggling. The slightest thing makes them laugh. They feel warm, and people also comment about that. 
they feel whole and integrated. They feel like you know the whole personality is now together. It's not fragmented. And they also feel like they can accomplish anything that they have gone through this this bad thing that was meant to break them. They triumphed and they became a lot, a lot stronger. I would like to end with this quote because poets also have commented about forgiveness, not just philosophers, theologians, and also uh, scholars and psychologists. Mark Twain, and I, I love his writings, he said forgiveness is the fragrance, you know, the nice smell that you have, that comes from the fragrance that the violet sheds on the heel that pressure. It's a very moving quote. Thank you very much.